The ICF Training and Technical Assistance Team is honored to welcome you to this California Housing Community Development um, training session offered through the Emergency Solution Grant Coronavirus Relief Consulting and Staffing Services Contract. I'm Chris Pitcher from ICF. I will be hosting today's session. Today's session is our final community workshop, um, uh, part of our community workshop series, and is entitled Coordinated Street Outreach and Effective Encampment Res uh, Response. <coughs> It's my privilege to introduce today's first presenter, Tom Albanese. Tom, take it away. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Tom Albanese, uh, consultants uh, working with the ICF team there in California. I'm actually based in Columbus, Ohio. I go by he, him pronouns. And uh, just by way of quick background, I'm a 30-year licensed social worker. Spent a lot of time in the Columbus system, both with the Community Shelter Board um, supporting uh, the system here and also in other parts of Ohio. And then uh, like my colleague, Matt, who I'll introduce here in a second, um, do a lot of technical assistance around the country with communities, um, large and small. So uh, Matt, why don't you introduce yourself and then I'll go through the agenda. Sure. Uh, Matt White, also part of the ICF consulting team. I use he, him pronouns, um, and also based in Columbus, uh, Ohio with Tom. Although my background is not clinical, um, my training is in um, city and community planning. Um, and so my approach to this work comes from a systems planning perspective. And I'm always um, thankful to work with Tom, um, who has sort of uh, skills and expertise in both of those areas, both clinical and systems work, um, and will be kind of uh, sort of bouncing back and forth and sharing perspectives from both of those uh, both of those experiences. Thanks, Matt. Thrilled to be here with you as well. Let's just go through the agenda super quick. Um, this is what uh, we want to get through in the next hour and a half. We're going to leave a lot of time for questions and discussion at the end, but I'll just say at the top here as well, Matt and I are really comfortable um, being interrupted and having uh, questions kind of thrown out or insights, things that uh, you all have done or seen. We would love to just uh, hear um, what's going on. Uh, we all have uh, our own kind of background and expertise to share. So we're just really excited to have a dialogue, but we do want to spend some time talking about the goals and role of street outreach, just to level set a little bit, including how, how teams are configured and what some of the staffing approaches look like, what the goals for street outreach coordination are. And then we're gonna dive into principles and practices for street outreach and coordination of street outreach and how to effectively uh, engage and help people resolve uh, literal homelessness when they're living in an encampment together and how to do that in a coordinated way that results in successful housing or other types of outcomes. And Matt's gonna share uh, with us as we talk through that, some, some really amazing community examples that, that, that he's actually directly uh, helped with. Uh, excited to learn more about that um, personally and professionally. And then also we're gonna spend some time uh, just talking about data and some of the emerging uh, information that's out there that's really pertinent to this conversation today. We want to get in front of you. Uh, so that's what we're uh, intending to do. We're just going to go ahead and dive in. And again, if you have questions or just comments or insights as we go through, don't hesitate to pop them in the chat. Raise your hand. Uh, Chris is uh, keeping an eye on things as well. And we'll, um, we'll uh, uh, throw things at us as uh, as you've got it. So let's just talk quickly. We Matt and I sort of putting this together thought it'd be helpful to just sort of start with a common conception and understanding of what the goals and role of street outreach uh, are in its all its iterations. And part of it is just understanding all its iterations. As many of you probably know, I'm sure some of you actually do street outreach or have a real depth of experience. This might be old news to you or just uh, really easily understood. Some of us are newer to this and just are trying to get our hands around all the various approaches to street outreach that communities are using and that programs use uh, to help people in need. Broadly speaking, if we consider the role of street outreach in a community, there's various roles that street outreach plays. First, of course, providing sort of a standalone, a specific type of programmatic intervention. It could be service and housing focused or full service kind of outreach team that provides comprehensive uh, clinical uh, and rehousing assistance and other basic needs assistance for a given population from start to finish. 
Uh, these are really more full-fledged, we might call them sometimes case-carrying teams that are really helping somebody in a holistic way. There's also more narrowly focused uh, service teams that might be uh, uh, really just specialized in dealing with medical issues, for example, or other acute behavioral health issues. And then there's basic needs focused teams. Uh, in Columbus, there uh, are teams that really focus primarily on making sure that people have food and safe uh, lodgings, be that a tent uh, or uh, other uh, support and are facilitated to get in to shelter. So they're really just dealing with that immediate basic need and helping people move to the next step as much as possible. There are other types of um, outreach like uh, entities, actors that communities need or that we see variations of, including those that focus on coordinated entry system or CES uh, access and sort of facilitating that very specifically and having a very defined role conducting assessment and navigating uh, to shelter and rehousing and other services uh, within the system. And then of course, there's uh, functionally speaking, uh, and you're gonna hear this a lot from Matt and I both, there really needs to be an emphasis and sometimes this is lacking around housing coordination and navigation uh, and really helping people move from the street to housing and stabilize in housing. This is oftentimes, um, like uh, you'll see this as a rapid rehousing program that does has a street outreach uh, component. So they've got some staff who work with people in unsheltered situations to basically do street to home assistance. And that's sort of what we mean by housing coordination and navigation as a functional role. And then finally, just crisis response. We see teams of different variety really responding to people who might be uh, having uh, severe behavioral health issues or having um, uh, some type of uh, medical emergency or other types of acute need, or perhaps there's behavioral issues that are causing uh, trouble in a given area. And you'll see teams like that. They're much more crisis oriented. So just to give you a flavor, kind of a lay of the land as far as the different functions and types of street outreach we see. And then as we dig down a little deeper, we also know that street outreach teams can be configured differently or structured differently. You can have a given agency that has its own outreach team. Sometimes you will see shelters that have their own outreach staff and they're sort of out in the field engaging folks, perhaps in a given geography that they serve. You'll see multidisciplinary disciplinary teams that have um, uh, sometimes up to and including uh, medical and uh, uh, more master's level and higher clinical staff and vocational staff and peer specialists and so forth who are really uh, providing that full service complement. And then we see teams that sometimes are um, adjacent to or connected with um, other uh, systems in our community like criminal justice uh, partners who might have uh, some investment or staff sort of dedicated to partnering with or actually conducting uh, street outreach or in the public health space. Uh, and so forth. Um, one example uh, I think we see a lot of are uh, improvement districts, local business districts, and other like non-typical you know entities um, starting to uh, collaborate and do more around uh, uh, people they're seeing who are unsheltered and and investing in staff or solutions. And that's uh, another way we're seeing uh, some street outreach teams take shape in communities or in specific areas in communities. Regardless of the structure or the scope of any team, though, as we mentioned earlier, it's critical that every team has a team member who's responsible, who's accountable, right, for providing or ensuring that every person engaged can access individualized rehousing assistance. It's a fundamental obligation of every outreach team and every outreach staff member to make sure the person we're helping, if they're currently unhoused, that we are treating that de facto as a crisis because it is. Even if that person has their immediate needs met and they've got a decent tent and their, their food is, is set for the night, even if they're hunky-dory or they seem like it at the moment, it is nonetheless a crisis because when you're unsheltered, you're at higher risk uh, for many things. And uh, I think uh, that's probably known to most of us here, but we want to underscore that importance on focus on housing and crisis resolution. Um, so when we start to think about the different variety of outreach in our community and 
what that starts to look like. Now we're really starting to get into brass tacks. And I think Matt uh, can share lots of examples and, and I can say from my own experience that when we start to get serious about ending unsheltered homelessness and helping people move more rapidly straight to housing, if need be through shelter, then we need to understand what we have to begin with. And that, that just specifically means we have to start to inventory our outreach capacity. And what are the teams that we have? How are they staffed? How are they funded? What is their goal? What, is, what are their accountabilities? Um, do they have outcomes that they are funded to achieve um, that match or don't match what the community needs in terms of helping people move from the street or an unsafe place into housing as quickly as possible. So looking at team configuration, staffing configurations is really important. And we have to do that with a level of detail that gives us actionable information. And so what you see here, I'm not gonna read this to, to everyone, but you can see the types of things that you need to start to inventory or catalog. And this will help you then determine, do you have teams or areas or functional aspects that you need in a robust, comprehensive, geography-wide outreach endeavor um, that are not there yet? In other words, do you have a team perhaps that, that does a great job with uh, you know, access to basic needs and behavioral health care, but they don't really know how to navigate and they don't have anybody on their team who's expert or they're not connected into the coordinated access system or entry system that gets people to individualized rehousing assistance. So that's a gap. In Columbus, we did this just by way of example. We inventoried all of our street outreach capacity. And what we learned was we had, I forget the exact number right now, somewhere in the vicinity of 15 or so full-time equivalent staff who we could say were housing focused, that they spent the majority of all their time helping people who were on the street obtain housing, providing that individualized assistance. And because we were able to identify how many FTE we had, we also estimated how many FTEs we needed. And the gap was something like two to three times the number of FTEs we currently had at that moment who were housing focused. If you think that of that, as a basic building block where a caseload doesn't exceed, say, 25 or so, maybe 30 cases, maybe a little bit more, but that's a stretch. Then you can start to size uh, how much capacity you've got versus how much you need at, a, at the most basic level in terms of rehousing assistance. And that's a really important outcome of this type of exercise and drilling down. Uh, but you also need, of course, to identify other gaps. Geographic coverage, uh, can anybody access an outreach team no matter where they are in your county, in your city, in your geography? Um, is it, is it uh, uh, known to people all, all across your geography how to access street outreach assistance? Is that through your front door to your homeless system? How does that happen? And where are the gaps, again, in knowledge or access? So this is all part of our due diligence to understand what we have. Um, once we do that, we can then start to, again, better organize what we have. And these are some of the objectives that we're trying to accomplish when we're now looking beyond just independent outreach efforts to a comprehensive, coordinated effort to end unsheltered homelessness and help people move from street to housing. And if we think about it from that vantage point, then we can start to consider where are the most important areas we need regular presence on site, in person, by a team uh, where somebody uh, who is uh, currently unhoused can readily access them. Where are those partners? Who are the partners uh, that we need to make sure our outreach teams are coordinating with? How do we, in other words, ensure that full coverage? And most of all, uh, as we do this, how do we make sure that anybody who is unhoused today has access to housing assistance? And this is why we can start to pivot from sort of a basic needs focus as somebody uh, I used to work with uh, would, would, uh, would say, you know, we have to move beyond handing out umbrellas and flashlights uh, to, to handing out housing vouchers and really individualized trauma-informed rehousing assistance. And how do we do that is really our objective here in this work and fundamentally 
and maybe most importantly, improving the experience and the outcomes of people who are unhoused and minimizing any harm or reducing harm as much as we can along the way. And that's really our, our important uh, uh, goal here. So I'm gonna pass it off to Matt, actually it's a perfect segue. Uh, Matt's gonna pick it up and, and, and talk a little bit more about principles and kind of move us forward. Great, Matt? yeah, thanks Tom. Uh, as I was thinking about uh, the work that I've done in communities to help develop an outreach coordination plan or a strategy, and these are communities from Houston, Cleveland, Detroit, looked a little bit in Miami and currently working in Portland, in each one of these communities, we always start by defining a set of guiding principles. The reason guiding principles are so useful or helpful is that there's often, and in every community that I where I've worked, this has been the case, I haven't come across one where there's not, there will be tension. There will be um, decision points where we have to come together and agree how we're going to make a decision or how we're going to move forward. So spending the time to define a set of guiding principles sort of your guardrails on what will you allow or how will your system operate or what is your North Star for organizing your approach, that will help not eliminate the conflict or the tension or the problems that you're going to face. Those are, are just, I think, a fact, but it helps you navigate them in a way that's gonna be more productive. So the example here, and these are just from a, a sample from communities where I've worked where these were really helpful as a, a way to organize their thinking and help to direct their decision making. And the first one is that um, first and foremost, we know from data that punitive approaches just don't work. Um, they're not effective at engaging people. They don't resolve uh, homelessness. Um, they don't uh, result in a housing placement. Um, so just giving people citations or moving them along uh, or, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, providing only kind of like just the minimal comfort and care um, is not going to result in um, in long term success, and so oftentimes just naming that and having that be a clear focus for the coordination plan um, that we're going to be engagement and housing focused rather than punitive uh, can be really helpful. Another one that I find that each community has adopted is an acknowledgement that this is not the result of uh, personal failings. And if we reorient our thinking around um, people who are in crisis as a safety net that has failed them, institutions and structures in, in, in the community that, that did not address their needs, um, it it uh, it reorients us to think that that people can be housed. They want to be housed. They want to be safe, uh, free from harm, uh, in a place that feels like their own, in a community that they define. Um, and so that becomes a guiding principle for how we coordinate or how, how one might coordinate outreach, including uh, a client choice. Um, uh, and, and not just in terms of uh, the the housing placement, but who they get to live with, the geography or the neighborhood. Um, is it close to employment? Is it close to a bus line? Uh, does it allow them to maintain their sense of what brings them satisfaction or what brings them a sense of community? Um, tying that to their housing choice is really useful in ensuring long-term success. And so that becomes a guiding principle. Another useful one is that if you, if a community were to assign all of outreach is the responsibility of agency X, and they're going to come up with the community's plan, um, and if it doesn't work, it's that particular agency, uh, it's some failure of that particular agency. That I've never found that to be an effective approach. So redefining um, the solution to unsheltered homelessness as a community-wide response and outreach as part of that community-wide system strategy. Also looking at how we um, encounter and engage people as not just a one and done, but persistence over time. And often um, there's uh, a long history of trauma, um, of failed connections, um, experiences that have been negative. Um, and so many people who are unsheltered require 
lots of uh, contacts and, and steady, smooth engagement over time. Um, and so defining that as the sort of principal element of outreach, that there's persistence and consistency over time is ultimately going to be more successful. Um, moving people uh, from an encampment or from an unsheltered location to uh, through their housing pathway often will require a stay in interim housing, whether that's shelter or some other interim uh, component, but it has to be a low barrier so that people are transitioning to a housing placement uh, in a way that meets their needs. If they're currently using um, substances, they have an untreated mental illness, uh, they're with uh, a community of people that they want to stay connected to, they have a pet or an animal that's important to them, they have belongings that are important, we need to make sure that the programming, the interim or crisis housing programming, allows those connections and allows those relationships to continue in a low barrier way. And then ultimately, permanent housing has to have, uh, for many people, it has to be coupled with supports. That if we just move people into an apartment and sign a lease, um, unless there are active uh, supports that are uh, positioned with that housing, uh, many people aren't going to be successful and that what those supports or those services look like are going to be very different depending on the individual uh, and so packaging them in a way uh, that's based on their needs their goals um, and their interests is going to be more helpful in the long run than just sort of a cookie cutter approach to the services so articulating this set of guiding principles as one of the sort of uh, inner the the initial stages in developing an outreach plan can be really helpful Let's look at some of the practice standards on the next slide, um, defining what we, when we say outreach, what does that actually mean? What do, what do we, uh, what are outreach workers or the practice of outreach? What is the expectation or what does that actually look like? So defining a set of expectations, activities um, uh, uh, that, that underscore, that provide a foundation for what outreach is. First, we look at what are the core responsibilities of an outreach worker. They're obviously going to be doing uh, making attempts at contact and engaging people over time, but we might want to define as part of their core responsibilities some HMIS data collection and entry into HMIS. Maybe there's some coordination of care and coordinating not just with their team, but with other team, whether that's behavioral health, physical health, uh, employment resources. Uh, maybe their responsibilities are actually very housing focused. So looking at what's their responsibility for helping someone apply for housing and navigating um, and moving in that, uh, in that housing focused way. Another key element of practice standards is looking at um, how we develop a client centered approach from the very beginning. Uh, what does that actually mean to say client centered? Uh, so breaking that down into the component parts of uh, being uh, identifying through an assessment or through a relationship oriented engagement with the client, what are their specific goals? What do they want to achieve? What are their interests in life? And then tying their housing plan to their goals. So a perfect example here is um, oftentimes we, uh, uh, in my work, I've encountered people um, who have developed strong relationships in their unsheltered camp. Um, and that those relationships, because there might be fractured relationships with family or friends from the history, those become sort of their alternative family. Um, so understanding that this is their family and they need to be housed with their redefined family or their friends or their support networks, that's a client-centered approach that's recognizing that that's ultimately their interest and that's going to help to contribute to long-term long success. So that might be an example of a client-centered approach where we're letting them define what family is or what their community is um, and developing a housing plan that, that honors and respects that. Um, developing clients' rights and choices as part of your practice standards. So if there's a violation of rights or perceived violation of rights, what's the process for a participant in an outreach program to voice a concern, to lodge a complaint? How does that get escalated? How does that get adjudicated um, in a way that, that protects their rights and their anonymity, um, but also uh, supports their housing progress? Um, so that might be defined as part of your practice standards for outreach, providing housing-focused case management, 
um, looking at the essential elements of a case management relationship that's housing focused and building that into outreach and actually kind of uh, delineating out or, or kind of the sequence of steps or the expectations for how a housing focused case management relationship evolves or develops over time. Lots of issues around safety, not just for clients, but for staff. Um, and so identifying what are the conditions under which maybe outreach is not an appropriate activity, whether it's the time or the place or the manner of the safety issue, um, and how staff can ensure uh, their safety, whether that's either engaging with um, uh, the police or doing team-oriented outreach, um, or if you see activities in an camp or a, an outreach um, that might be uh, uh, unsafe for clients, uh, what's the responsibility of staff to name that and then to ensure that we're as much as possible uh, building a safe environment um, or ensuring a safe environment? And then what's your, uh, for many outreach workers who are also uh, licensed social workers, responsibilities for reporting if they see abuse or if they see uh, unsafe conditions, what, what are their expectations uh, to, to identify, call that out, and to escalate that to the appropriate authorities. Defining in your practice standards the process of doing an assessment, whether that's um, uh, an assessment that's staged over time, uh, one and done. Uh, oftentimes there are, you know, comprehensive psychosocial assessments. Sometimes there's more uh, uh, stepwise assessments that occur where you're building layers of information over time. So just, just articulating, what is that? What do we, when we say an assessment, what's the tool, what's the protocol, the timing, the staging of that? Supporting clients through their housing application and move-in process, if that is the expectation, and that is a best practice for outreach, but if that is the expectation for the outreach staff, not to, to transition someone to a housing navigator, but to actually support the housing application and move-in process as an outreach worker, then actually spelling that out as part of their duties um, and building that into your practice standards. Um, and then just also, there will be natural transitions, um, transitions to a full-time case manager, maybe to a navigator if those functions are split in your community. Um, if there's uh, another uh, care coordination or resource person uh, that you're working with with your client, ensuring that those transitions are successful, often with a warm handoff, um, is also part of the expectations for your shelter standards. Matt, can I add in two more things? Just I realize as you're as you're running through this for us, there's two areas that that we didn't add here, but we should probably highlight. One is around training and yeah. making sure your your standards outline all those train. Actually, you probably take this entire list and you 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 could mm -hmm. crosswalk it to training content. And I say that specifically because I think Matt, to your point around housing application and moving process, if that is the specific obligation or, or responsibility of an outreach staff person, people I've learned and really come to appreciate, people don't learn local systems and how, how to do, how to support somebody in the housing application process. They don't learn that by osmosis. Yeah. We have, we have to be, we, our homeless systems and our agencies and our programs have to be intentional about making sure those training uh, uh, opportunities are baked into your hiring and your staffing plans, and you've got that fully outlined in an onboarding uh, uh, set of uh, content areas for new staff and for existing staff, because each one of those areas is so critical, and sometimes we give them short shrift. Uh, and then the other area my Matt, I just wanted to lift up was um, training, as it were, but also um, uh, standards around data collection. And uh, mm -hmm. you sort of touched on this earlier, but it, I think we've, we've really come to appreciate the importance of street outreach staff using consistent um, standardized approaches for data collection, specifically around engagement. Well, I'll start with contacts, engagement, when engagement happens, intake, assessment, and maybe most of all, uh, when somebody should be exited from an outreach uh, project and how do you make sure that's properly recorded and what do you do when somebody disappears? Um, and what uh, is chronically a problem with outreach projects is oftentimes clients just remain open on the caseload. And mm -hmm. this gives us an inaccurate picture 
uh, and and as a community, we can't really see who's on the ground if that data isn't isn't kept up to date. So I just want to underline that. Those are well. great additions. Yeah, we should definitely include those in the. Um, after we have our guiding principles and our practice standards drafted, um, it the next thing I wanted to talk about was just doing an actual assessment of the un, the encampment or of your unsheltered uh, uh, the nature of unsheltered um, uh, communities in your region. This actually grew out of an effort. Um, it's in Houston, Texas, a very large dispersed geographic area. Um, and there were probably 40 different encampments and each of them was quite different. And as we, as a community, uh, we're beginning to kind of sequence or stage our approach for decommissioning encampments, we needed to understand the unique characteristics or attributes within each encampment to help us understand the approach. There is not a sort of one size fits all. Each encampment had a slightly different engagement strategy. The resources were necessary to, to, to decommission the encampment were a little bit different. Um, the, the sort of the culture, the, the nature of the relationships in the, in the community were different. So we came up with an assessment tool um, and I'd be happy to share it, but it's an assessment tool of an encampment that uses, uh, we had public health, police, um, our general services that did uh, some of the kind of cleaning work and our outreach teams all kind of organize what, how do we want to understand the nature of an encampment and came in, uh, to these kind of six broad uh, groupings. The first is just the actual size. Um, and a large medium uh, encampment is going to be different in every community. In LA, uh, a large encampment could be several hundred people. In, um, in Marin County, a large encampment could actually be 12 people. So the, 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 it, this is sort of contextual based on the nature of the community that you're in, but it's useful to actually define this so that your community is having a consistent strategy around engagement uh, and uh, an approach to encampment decommissioning based on size. So think about how your unsheltered homelessness is distributed across the CFC or across your geography, and then group them by large, which will make sense for your community medium. And then what I term hotspots. Hotspots are typically one person or maybe a very small group, two, possibly three, usually not more than four or five people in one area. Then we look at the location characteristics. And the, again, the approach to both outreach to the encampment and the process of, of uh, developing a decommissioning strategy is going to be different. Is it uh, private land uh, where you're going to have to interact with a private uh, land owner? Um, are there neighboring properties or businesses that are going to be impacted by the outreach work? And so you might want to develop a relationship with them to let them know what's happening. How visible is the encampment? And that might determine especially, uh, I mean, it is increasingly become, unsheltered homelessness is becoming sort of a political issue in communities. Um, and the extent to which it's very visible in a prominent either downtown or business area, that's going to dictate how you as an outreach or as a community respond when there's a lot of public pressure um, or political pressure because of the visibility. Look at the criminal activity. We often conflate unsheltered homelessness with other kinds of activities that might occur either adjacent or part of, or part of an encampment. But they're very different. If there's uh, drug dealing, uh, human trafficking, it may it will definitely require engagement with your uh, with your police or the criminal justice system to ensure that you have the resources and the approaches that make sense based on uh, the nature of that encampment. Then we look at the population of people that are in the encampment, and if it warrants a specialized approach, different kinds of services, uh, looking at how we're going to be making referrals to housing, do we have the right kinds of housing mixes or services based on uh, how acute, uh, if there's an elderly population, um, if there's people living in cars with children, does that dictate how we're going to go in and, and they, uh, the approach? Looking at environmental health issues, 
if there um, people are using fuel to burn fires and that creates a hazardous uh, condition, maybe there's bio waste that needs to be cleaned, um, other conditions around uh, vermin. Um, we look at also community safety issues. If the encampment is close to uh, oncoming traffic or under an overpass and there's the risk of people um, coming in contact with oncoming traffic, um, that elevates often uh, the sense of urgency to manage that encampment um, and a decommissioning process in a different way. And then also just once an encampment is uh, it's slated for a decommissioning, um, trying to understand what the role is for um, general services or solid waste to come in and dispose of materials that are not uh, the belongings of individuals and left behind, we need to manage that process as well. So for each of these areas, we come, I think there's a scale um, and it allow, there's a narrative section and allows us to define the encampment and then also to rank in terms of urgency or crisis um, and then stage uh, the approach to the particular encampment based on how acute or how, um, uh, how urgent the need is to address that particular one. And Matt, oh, can I yeah. Uh, one one other quick point. I, I don't want to interrupt interrupt your flow, but um, uh, I think uh, you alluded to this as well. But I just want to say that uh, in Columbus, when we did not nearly as much as Matt, you've done in other communities, but a little bit of this and started organizing around encampments. Part of the uh, approach we took was to insist on housing capacity equivalent to the encampment being decommissioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, from a system vantage point, it gave us a point of leverage. Uh, to negotiate for more investment in, in housing, particularly low barrier housing, uh, if, if possible. But just to, to, to kind of make the point that no one, as you said earlier, Matt, is just sort of intentionally um, and, and involuntarily moved from a place they're living yes. in an encampment or what have you without a viable next option that meets them where they are. And as you've said so well, Matt, some people are where you're meeting them is in their small community with their chosen families. Mm -hmm. So how do you address that? Is this part of your, yeah. your, um, your assessment, Matt? And I, this is an assessment for staging communities for decommissioning, but I, I wanna be clear, not every community is at a point where they're decommissioning encampments. If you, and I totally agree with this, Tom, if you do not have the housing capacity, the resources on the back end to actually make a referral to um, either an interim step, if that's the most appropriate, or directly to housing through rapid rehousing or market rate housing, if they have employment or income or PSH or whatever the housing strategy is, then the recommendation is not to, to do any kind of decommissioning or relocation because it's it doesn't contribute to a community goal and certainly doesn't address the, the ultimate uh, uh, unsheltered crisis just by relocating to another jurisdiction. So in all of the what these examples that I'm giving where we're uh, doing these assessments and staging these communities, it's only doing a decommissioning when there's a housing resource directly linked to every single person who's in the encampment. There's another set of assessments uh, that are specific to just a, a housing focused assessment. Um, and so going into an encampment, say it's 20 people it, in the communities where I worked, that means we have to have 20 housing referrals in our back pocket ready to make or offers that are legitimate offers. And for some people, the take up rate is gonna be great and they'll move directly into their own apartment within a week probably likely there's going to be a more phased approach that might have interim steps, um, but we don't decommission unless there's a housing strategy attached to every single person in the encampment. Uh, so that I think is, is, I just wanted to underscore that piece. But there, and, and this is going to be the case in California, there aren't housing resources readily available for every person who's unsheltered. So if we look at the next slide, this kind of refers to the kind of outreach and how you respond to encampments. Um, and it might be that outreach and engagement is the as much capacity as you have and you don't have the housing resources, at least not immediately today to offer. So the focus is really on connection, um, getting people connected to uh, services and resources that might help them. But there isn't a specific encampment that you're targeting for decommissioning. 
Another approach is to look at uh, if there is an encampment, whether or not it makes sense to provide basic services to people in that setting, whether that's safety, um, maybe some patrols, uh, maybe you can bring uh, services on site um, to address a particular need that you've identified. Um, this, an example here is that's often uh, considered as something like safe parking, where you identify a parking lot or a particular region, um, and you provide resources to people in that area. So it's a sanctioned encampment. Um, another approach is uh, a sanctioned encampment, but you have a relocation process. So um, it, people are moved um, from either an unsheltered location that's in an inappropriate or unsafe location to a designated camping area that either provides uh, more opportunity for engagement, increased safety, uh, or a linkage to some housing resource that's tied to that encampment. So that might be part of your strategy, a sanctioned encampment um, that's, uh, that's part of your relocation process. Another approach is just periodic cleaning, um, where part of your encampment is to make sure that if there are uh, belongings or trash um, or uh, bio waste that's providing a public health concern, that you're addressing that by identifying a cleaning strategy. Um, strategies that don't work, but that are identified for some locations is clearance and closure, um, where residents are just, you help them find an alternative housing, um, you give them notification, you support them through outreach, um, but they can't return to that encampment after a certain amount of time. Oftentimes in these kinds of approaches, clearance and closure, there isn't a housing resource that's always attached to it. So it's not one of the ones that we recommend or that's often successful, uh, but sometimes the politics or the circumstances um, or the location warrant um, an immediate closure because of health or safety issues. Always, uh, we want to ensure that people are given the kinds of resources and supports to maintain their housing. Um, but it's not unlikely that people will go back to a place that's familiar to them, where they have friends or a community um, that felt uh, like their home. So we have to have a very thoughtful conversation uh, with uh, people in encampments about uh, what does it mean um, to come back to the area, whether it's panhandling or engaging in activity that um, is not appropriate. Um, so coming up with a prevention strategy, um, and, and there is a whole nother sort of webinar on uh, engaging people um, in a prevention strategy so that you don't reestablish encampment areas. And then finally, I have it on the slide here because it is an approach that some communities use, but as we've mentioned before, it's not particularly successful. It doesn't result in uh, resolving homelessness, and it is uh, for the most part, traumatic and causes more harm. And that's just the criminalization where there is a citation uh, for loitering or for nuisance um, and, uh, and you're forcing people um, to, uh, to either move along without an alternative or you're criminalizing um, which, uh, what is essentially um, just extreme poverty. Not the best approach. So let's and, and, we, and, and adding more barriers, Matt. Right? And, adding, yeah, and then they have to resolve those. Yeah, all of those uh, warrants or you know fines or whatever. So it's not um, it's not going to result in anything. So I want to share um, three examples. Um, Houston, as I mentioned before, I was able to work with in an intensive way and develop an outreach strategy that had an encampment decommissioning component to it. Um, and th there's a whole report that was written on the, how that process works. Um, it's also been written up in the New York Times, and so you can just do a Google search and find a great article about the results from Houston. I also wanted to find an example from California, so um, I have uh, uh, an example that we'll share there, and then um, some recent work in Seattle around creating something called a housing central command or a command structure that helps to organize uh, outreach efforts and it's tied to their encampment strategy. So we'll we'll talk about that one. So Houston, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, well, first I'll just give you some of the highlights for the, the sort of attributes of Houston. The lead uh, 
community, uh, the lead organization for the CFC is called the Houston Coalition. Um, and they received uh, uh, significant public funding during the pandemic through the CARES Act. So that was ESG, coronavirus or ESG CV. They also had ARPA funds and they had one of these downtown managed district, management districts that also invested um, uh, resources with the focus on decommissioning encampments um, rather than standing up non-congregate shelter. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, many communities uh, were approaching the public health uh, crisis by separating people or creating safe distance um, and decongregating or uh, creating um, uh, individual shelter units to arrest the spread of COVID. Houston made a slightly different, uh, a significantly different uh, choice. Rather than invest the energy and resources and time to create non-congregate shelter, Houston said, well, why don't we just house them? We're gonna go through all of this extra work to create uh, non-congregate shelter. That's about the same energy and, and complication and time it would take to just house them. So why don't we just house them? Um, so that was the beginning of their decommissioning, their encampment decommissioning process is because they put all of their, uh, their COVID resources into housing rather than into emergency shelter. They looked at three different core responses, diversion, which is a modest amount of financial assistance to reconnect people to safe alternative housing, often family and friends, scaling up rapid rehousing uh, using uh, private landlords with a 12-month subsidy renewable to 24 months if people still needed it, and then traditional PSH. And they used their PSH uh, existing inventory and they projected out the amount of regular turnover or regular slots of PSH that would become available during the course of a year. And then they sort of, um, they bridged people to those expected PSH units using rapid rehousing. So everyone got rapid rehousing as an immediate response to the public health crisis many of the people who were eligible for PSH were placed into rapid rehousing and that rapid rehousing was simply just a bridge. So they maintained that same tenant-based unit, uh, but it transitioned to permanent housing um, uh, uh, when there was a natural opening in PSH and so that client could just be transitioned. So that was their response to the pandemic. These outreach teams um, then coordinated with housing navigators so that they had landlords, they had housing units in their back pocket, and they could do a warm handoff. So when they were doing outreach, and they would uh, uh, contact and do uh, an engagement, there was always a housing resource attached to that. Um, and there was always a warm handoff to support the, the project based case manager. So the rapid rehousing or PSH case manager. So the outreach, the navigation, and the case management and housing all coordinated in a warm handoff to ensure that that transition was successful for the client. We then looked at each encampment, the number of people in the encampment and the number of housing resources that we would need, and we would plan for a week-long housing surge event. So this typically would take, we would start the planning maybe four to six weeks out. The typical encampment was around 25 to 30 people. We would ensure um, that uh, that housing was available, and then we would kind of build our uh, active engagement, um, uh, knowing that the encampment was going to be decommissioned and people would be given a choice about where to live, but they weren't given a choice about staying in the encampment. So that was very clear that the encampment would close, it would be decommissioned, and everyone was provided a housing resource. And then that that process of actually closing the camp occurred in one week, when um, all the outreach and all the housing providers were sort of on site um, to, to help manage that process. And we did, those were basically housing surge events and we did one a month. So now let's look at what this, how this plays out when you're doing a housing surge during the course of a week. On this slide at the top is a typical Monday and you can see um, on this particular roadway, all of the tents or the, um, the temporary shelters sort of interspersed within the trees. And uh, leading up to this event, every single person was assessed. Everyone had a housing strategy. So by the first day, by Tuesday, we'd already engaged everyone. We'd already started the move out process. 
Uh, midway through the week on Wednesday, you can see uh, most of the tents are gone and all the belongings are sort of organized so that they can transition or be moved with the housing to the person. And by the end of the week, um, there was just one or two tents left. The part of the strategy of doing these housing surge events, number one, everyone has to have housing. We do not, uh, in Texas or in, in Houston, they did not initiate a decommissioning unless there was a housing resource for everyone in the encampment. And number two, there had to be a strategy for maintaining the clearance once it was decommissioned. So there was an active participation with neighborhood groups, community organizations, police, uh, the downtown redevelopment district or, or uh, management district to ensure that there was ongoing uh, outreach to the region that was decommissioned even after everyone left. And if there was one person that had set up a, a lean-to or a temporary structure or a tent, they were immediately engaged and redirected to a housing resource so that visibly the nature of that encampment becomes redefined as public space that's available for everyone and is no longer an identified encampment. So you can see, and in fact, I'm in Houston today, um, this is what this area looks like today. It, um, it look, is a park-like setting um, with these trees, um, and there are, it, this was in, from a year and a half ago. So for the past year and a half, it has maintained uh, the status of uh, not being um, not being an encampment. The next example I want to share is from California. So Salinas, Monterey, San Benito County. I think some of the characteristics of this particular region, it's obviously not nearly the concentration of the intensity of Houston, but there are several attributes that I think uh, are worthy of, of mentioning. Multiple outreach teams, and often the different outreach teams have a particular focus, whether that's geographic, or they're a specific population, whether it's youth, or they have a specialization, mental illness. In the past, those would be seen as disparate, separate outreach efforts, but coordinating the street outreach among all of those teams, even though they're not serving exactly the same clientele, is a form of care coordination, and it's getting a more comprehensive sort of vi visual understanding of the community. And it's you're able to build a more comprehensive outreach strategy then by integrating the, the strategies of different teams. Ensuring that your outreach serve as access points so that it's not just outreach for outreach sake, but it's outreach that results in a connection to or an engagement as part of your system. Um, and this includes the full spectrum. So not doing an intake, full assessment, helping with the application process, and then supporting uh, unsheltered persons through the housing referral process. Another attribute um, uh, of uh, Monterey that I think is, is an interesting is they have an open data system. So this allows them to support care coordination. If, if I see uh, an individual who's engaged in outreach, but they're not on my caseload, I can access the HMIS to understand who is the, the care coordinator or the case manager and drop in a note or understand what's the next step. And maybe I can communicate with the unsheltered individual about, okay, you're, you're actively applying for housing and you're waiting for, there was a denial and so you've, you've resubmitted application. And I can provide that information even though I'm not the case manager or the care coordinator, uh, but I'm delivering uh, through an open system, the ability to understand where that person is in the process and if there's any kind of glitch or problem that I might be able to help uh, troubleshoot. And then finally, um, the outreach coordination across uh, multiple teams um, and uh, an alignment across the, the whole community strategy. Um, I don't know. I'm just wondering if there are any questions or if this is a good pause point or if we should keep. I don't think there are any, Matt. I've been dropping some comments in the chat just related. Oh, to great. Okay. okay. The next example then, moving on from California, um, is to Seattle. As I mentioned before, there's this emerging model that uh, Seattle, a couple of other communities have, um, have started to refine called a housing command center or central command. And the idea is that you physically locate outreach, housing resources, navigation resources, and often system resources in one 
physical location that allows you to sort of um, uh, uh, accelerate the coordination um, without having to like leave messages or emails and wait for people to come back here. Everyone is literally in the same room. It's almost like a disaster response when you have a, um, a, dis a, a an emergency response team that's physically located in the same room to coordinate care. So this is the Seattle model. They're looking at decommissioning large downtown encampments, uh, very urban in nature. Um, and they had multiple uh, uh, data sets um, that they were able to draw from. So they integrated data, not just from their HMIS, but from public health systems and the criminal justice system. And this allowed them to build a complete picture. So as they were developing a care coordination plan, if there were outstanding warrants, someone maybe uh, was uh, had medication coordination or management that they needed to be built into their housing plan, um, other people were frequent users of crisis response, whether that was an emergency room or psychiatric care. Um, and so that was built into their response, knowing that that um, that they were frequent users. So the the integrated multiple data sets was a, is a characteristic of the Seattle approach. Targeted outreach and housing resources, again, paired together. Um, and it was based on data. So they looked at the highest concentration of uh, persons in a single encampment, not necessarily the ones that were drawing the most community complaints. So this is driven by data, not driven by sort of the emotional, uh, the heightened sort of political response to unsheltered homelessness. And it allows them to fall back when they're then dealing with questions around efficacy or staging of why you're going to this particular encampment and not another one. They were able to respond to that with um, saying that they were uh, informed by data-based decisions uh, rather than just sort of the, you know, roaming quickly all over the community Community, trying to uh, put band-aids everywhere. Um, it was very focused intentional response in one targeted area. The other piece that characterizes the Seattle response is a very thoughtful and intentional uh, approach to um, uh, how they're managing the disparate impact of unsheltered homelessness on certain populations. Um, their Black and Indigenous populations are overrepresented in their unsheltered counts as are persons who identify as LGBT. Um, and so they developed partnerships with uh, culturally specific organizations that were able to provide the kind of engagement resources and using in a peer-based way, using uh, staff who had come from an unsheltered or from a lived experience of homelessness um, that looked and could share the same kinds of experiences as a better strategy for engagement. Um, and that also has resulted in stronger connections, better engagement, um, accelerated uh, housing placements, because the focus is providing culturally specific services with staff who look like the clients that they're serving. I think those are some great examples of what works in other communities. Right. Well, Matt, thank you for walking us through that. And I just I'll piggyback on that point about uh, representation um, and making sure teams uh, and staff and all the way up the ladder um, look like uh, the people being engaged is so critical. And 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 part of that, of course, to state the obvious, is uh, driven by the data itself. Um, and so when we take a moment to, to look at national, and we, we're not going to talk through all these points uh, with you right now, but we wanted to get it in front of you, it will inform and help to direct our work. And frankly, it'll give us grounding and, um, uh, and perhaps at times the, the um, sort of the backing we need to have a more rights-based approach, to, as you put it, Matt, a data-based approach to driving our resources. Of course, there are still times when communities are just being reactive. And as a, as a continuum of care, as a system, as a homeless service provider, sometimes we just have to go with the flow and make it work and be as principled as possible. But when we talk about this data, um, I think it's important we have both national and, and, uh, and state and community context. We wanted to just draw a couple major points, you know, why we're talking about unsheltered homelessness more than 
we ever have in my career, and Matt and I have been doing this a long time, uh, and there's not been this much focus ever before. And we're all glad there is focus and there needs to be more. Partly it's driven by the growing, as we all probably know, if you don't know the numbers, you surely see people uh, in your community, the growing number of people who are unsheltered. And nationally, uh, it, is, uh, it is ballooning. Uh, I think in California, especially, uh, which has uh, the almost a uh, little bit more than half or about half of all unsheltered people in the country live in California. Uh, it is a growing um, uh, problem and it's a growing national dialogue. So we really have um, an obligation to be as informed as we can. And there's some contours to these numbers. I want to just draw out, as Matt, you just said, uh, we see disproportionate impact all the way down the ladder to the street from people, <laughs> you know, just generally in our communities. And then we start to look at people who are in poverty. And then we start to look at people who are in deep poverty. And then we might look at people who are without housing and perhaps without food security and are really at, at struggling the most economically all the way down to people who are unhoused on the street arguably uh, in some of the worst conditions a, a community can, can have. And every step down that ladder, we see growing disproportionality, particularly among black and brown people and also among LGBTQ plus folks and others. Um, perhaps not discussed as much as it should be is the growing disproportion, disproportionate impact among people with a disabling condition, one or more disabling conditions. And that's something we also want to point out here is increasingly uh, people who are experiencing literal homelessness of any form are reporting one or more significant, persistent disabling conditions. And so we have uh, a growing number of folks who are both struggling with the disability and who are aging at the same time, right? So growing vulnerability and need among people experiencing homelessness. Um, this is perhaps um, best um, uh, illustrated in work I've done separately in Sacramento recently to help them with their gaps analysis and building on their point in time count. When we did uh, the analysis and looked at the point in time count data in particular, we found very troubling trends. One is that 58% uh, of adults now reporting at least one or more uh, severe persistent disabling conditions. This is up from 40% just a, a handful of years ago. This was the 2022 point, count, point in time count. So there's a three-year gap there, but it's growing. Now we can say definitively the majority of adults in Sacramento County who are unsheltered have at least one, but likely multiple severe persistent disabling conditions as they're reporting. Um, and when we looked at uh, uh, the uh, uh, survey data and examined uh, what was going on with folks in terms of using local homeless assistance resources, we also found that not only could people not access assistance when they wanted it, oftentimes if it was available, they wouldn't access it because it wasn't a trauma-informed, uh, humane option for them or did not seem like a reasonable, viable option for them. Oftentimes, of course, because of issues people struggle with and the community they create when they have to uh, out in an, uh, a location in the community. So these are important things we have to be aware of. Um, beyond that though, and I just to sort of underline this point around disabling conditions, uh, the California Policy Lab, as some of you may know, conducted a national survey, it wasn't limited just to people in California, very large survey, three-year survey. I want to say it concluded in 2019. I'm going off of memory there, but not that long ago. And their key finding, this is their headline, you know, quote in their finding. I'll just let you sort of read it for a moment. Um, it speaks to, again, what people are saying they're struggling with and what they need, uh, what they're finding when they're uh, trying to access uh, assistance. And instead of getting help, it's trauma-informed, it's person-centered that meets people, I hate to say an old social work adage, but I will meet people where they are. Uh, instead of criminalizing them, we're hearing that exact feedback from people who are currently unhoused uh, as to what their needs are and where we're not we're not meeting the mark as a community. So this is important that we remind ourselves of this qualitative information. And lastly, 
to, to bring forward something that was just published uh, about a month or two ago, the U UCF, so U UCSF Benioff uh, Homelessness and Housing Initiative did a massive survey of adults 18 year, years and older experiencing homelessness in California. And uh, it's really getting a lot of attention for good reason. Um, and, and I think Matt would agree, you know, we as a field haven't had this much information. Granted, it's, it's particular to California, but it's not unique to California. Um, but we haven't had this much sort of qualitative feedback compiled in a rigorous way that is empirically sound and representative in a long time, I would argue since uh, early work uh, in the late 90s and 2000s that we, we haven't uh, seen this, this amount of, I haven't, uh, information. And there's a lot here. We just sort of pulled forward some of the key findings. There's a lot in this report. We all have an obligation to spend some time with this information and to reflect on it and to think about the services and responses that our community is offering to people. Uh, but mainly I think about this as well as an opportunity to give us better insight as to where to direct our attention and how to uh, provide help. And one thing that stands out to me in, in the Benioff uh, data is uh, what people are uh, saying in terms of their recent experience prior to completing the survey, in, in, in particular where they were before they entered homelessness. Um, and of course, we have other data in HMIS that gives us clues as to where folks are coming from and where they're going. Uh, these become important points beyond you know, decommissioning a camp or engaging somebody who's already unsheltered. This tells us maybe where we need to have more robust partnerships uh, and, and opportunities for uh, folks before they hit the street uh, and see if we can't help them avoid that. Uh, and we know as well that most people, nearly half, are coming from uh, uh, unstable uh, housing situations where they have no control. They're not the leaseholder, they're living with friends or family, uh, and is very tenuous. Um, so that speaks to the need, Matt, you said this earlier, but the importance of diversion or rapid resolution, or we can call it lots of different things, but bottom line is just about housing problem solving and helping uh, folks maybe reconcile with a friend or family for even a little while, while they get on a longer term housing pathway. Matt, did you wanna add in? I, one of the, I think, the striking um, things from, from this study, and I always get so frustrated when a community or public officials say, well, people are coming to California because we have such rich services and there's so much public investment directed to unsheltered and to, uh, to housing resources now that it's attracting. It has this magnet effect. And one of the interesting findings from the Benhoff uh, study is that the vast majority, and I don't know what the percentage is, but it's like 90% of people yeah. become homeless in the community that they grew up in. Um, they lost, there is a one-time kind of crisis or event that uh, contributes to their housing loss. Um, they're not moving to California. So that's a, it's a really useful tool to help kind of eliminate, uh, better communicate and eliminate that myth um, with community members or public officials who don't want to make the necessary investments in the homelessness system because they feel like it just attracts or it creates a magnet for people from other jurisdictions who are moving to California to take advantage of that, uh, of, that of those rich resources. Good point. Um... And I, I wish now I would have dropped that that uh, that <laughs> bullet in here, but that that was a that jumped out to me as well. It's it's a myth buster, right? And Matt, yeah. I think the point is is that you know we have a, a job to do to dispel myths, and we can do that most readily with with um, empirical data. And that's mm -hmm. why this study is so important. It is it is, uh, and why it's getting so much national attention. It is it was done rigorously. And this is uh, very, very reliable, and uh, we can say representative of uh, people uh, we, we, we are trying to help. Um, so there's a couple other things as well. Just uh, the, again, we sort of cherry picked some of these uh, from the report. There's a lot more in the report, uh, but there are some things here that I think are telling and give us some indication as to how to focus uh, our, our uh, strategies to help people who are unsheltered, but also to better understand the challenges and characteristics of, of folks. Um, and I thought some, some of the points here, particularly around 
uh, again, uh, health issues, as we uh, we noted, are um, are really uh, emphasized here and and are uh, clearly an issue. And then uh, finally, I would add that you know there's um, there are challenges uh, around trauma. Uh, in the earlier slide, you saw the data point around how many uh, uh, people uh, experience traumatizing events and carry that with them. Uh, if, if we know anything about trauma, we know it doesn't go away. And we know we have a responsibility to be ready uh, for helping people who have gone through trauma, experience it, and maybe currently experiencing it. Uh, and so again, it speaks to the nature, uh, the importance of doing things right and in a non-punitive way, it doesn't uh, heap on trauma and harm. Uh, and I'll just uh, conclude that point before we turn to some resources and open up for any questions by saying, you know, as a licensed social worker, I have an ethical obligation to do no more harm. And uh, I don't really care if you're licensed or not. If you're in this space and you're doing this work, you have the same ethical obligation. And as Matt, as you said earlier, this really has to be where we start, where the work starts, particularly with our community partners and our law enforcement friends who are trying to do the right thing, but just using the tools they're used to often. So we need to also engage our partners and help them uh, see a path forward that is productive and meets the community's needs and doesn't uh, uh, create more harm for some members of our community. So with that, I just wanna uh, turn us briefly to a few more uh, resources these are things that uh, uh, you will find uh, helpful when the slides go out. You'll be able to access these links uh, pretty readily, but uh, th there are some uh, new, newer national uh, um, uh, strategies, particularly in the All Inside initiative from USICH, we'll all want to be paying attention to. And uh, if you don't know by now, you probably will soon, but HUD has made significant, for the first time ever, investments in addressing unsheltered homelessness, and there's new support coming to communities, including the whole state of California, which I believe Matt's might be latched into. And uh, uh, so anyway, more to come around unsheltered homelessness, but uh, now we want to just uh, stop showing our screen and stop talking so much and just open it up for questions. And Chris, I'm gonna punt over to you to help facilitate. Thanks, Tom. I've been combing the uh, chat here. Um, as we got ready for this, I haven't seen any questions per se, so I'd love to have folks just either put something in the chat or go ahead and come off mute and talk to Matt and Tom uh, about this topic. I think it's, uh, I know for, for me here in Denver, it's definitely a real thing, um, dealing with unsheltered. Um, I live right downtown and I see it every day, and the way in which we're dealing with it is not any way in which Matt or Tom described today, uh, or the way we had been, the way we're going to hopefully sounds more in line. So love to hear thoughts, how things are working in your community, um, some obstacles you might have come across, anything in that realm, please feel free uh, to come off mute and ask your question. You see that in the chat, you want me to read that to you, Tom? I think you got it. <laughs> I can read it, Matt. I'll let you take a first uh, take at it. Yeah, so the, it looks like the question is, what would you all suggest would be effective strategies to build engagement with those that are unsheltered? Um, the, a couple of strategies that that I'm helping to support in communities that seem to work uh, is a peer model. Um, it works on a couple of levels. So engaging people who are unsheltered, um, building their economic capacity by actually paying them to accompany you with unsheltered. They often have information about where people are. Um, they, uh, they're paired with a trained clinician. Um, so it's both building the capacity of the peer uh, person, but it's also providing a stronger, more sort of real life connection to unsheltered people because they see someone maybe that they know or that has experienced unsheltered homelessness. So that's one engagement strategy, actually employing people with lived experience um, to be paired with your more clinical or professionally trained staff. Um, the, the other piece I, I think I mentioned this, but I, I just want to underscore it if it wasn't, if I didn't, um, that persistence, that that oftentimes uh, people who are unsheltered have experienced trauma and um, 
and, and a series of setbacks and disappointments and frustrations in their own lives. And so the, the, the prospect of engaging in housing oftentimes feels for people like one more opportunity to fail. Um, and the way to confront that is through persistence, client-centered uh, engagement, um, where you're addressing what is the, the individual's goal, what is of most importance to them. And oftentimes it's not about housing, but if but that's okay. If it's not about housing, but they can articulate reunification with a loved one. Um, maybe they want to go back to a, a community that they lived in um, when they were young or that they do have family or social connections. Um, maybe they uh, have um, a relationship that they want to develop or rekindle or, or, um, or address that's been fractured from the past. If we can tie that to housing, that interest, that goal, what's important to them in that moment, uh, connect it to some kind of housing goal, uh, you're more likely to maintain uh, long-term engagement. So using people with lived experience as part of your outreach strategy and recognizing that people are going to have different goals that often are not housing focused, at least not initially, and that's okay, but we need to tie or connect their interests, their goals uh, to a housing focus, and ultimately you'll, you'll, uh, you'll hope, hopefully that will land with them. I'll just add to that quickly, Matt. I think uh, I work in a, a community in Ohio called Clinton County. Clinton County has 40,000 or so residents. So it's on the on the op one end of a spectrum of communities I work with. And um, uh, their outreach focuses on a few, believe it or not, very large encampments that would rival any urban area that kind of go under the radar in Clinton County and their approach to engagement, I think is so it's, it's simple, it's basic, and it's, it really makes sense is they take food and, you know, that's a need everyone has and everyone uh, that they uh, it, uh, visit is happy to receive food and other hygiene and other uh, personal items. And it's a way to start a conversation. I'm probably stating the obvious, but I do feel like sometimes it, it, it can be as basic as that. But the downside of that is, and I'm going to add to what you said too, Matt, is it has to be housing. There has to be an intent there, right? And I would argue a commitment to see somebody through to a more stable, safe place to live. And that today, that might not even be a concern of theirs. They might be totally great with where they are. They got their buddies down there, their, their camp is set up fine. They're relatively safe. They're not necessarily asking for housing. What I found, and Matt, it speaks to your point around persistence, is not only do we need to be persistent, but we have an obligation to, um, I think, spread hope, if I could put it that way, and give people a reason to mm -hmm. not be dispirited and feel like this is just going to be another failure. So I'm not going to talk about housing, but hey, if you want to give me some bags of food, that's great. What I find is that in certain instances, street outreach staff doing the best job they can may have inadvertently conveyed a, a sense of hopelessness because they say, you know, there just is no affordable housing. You know, it's that, it's that, it's that, um, it's that problem that exists only in our community and everywhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that we don't have any affordable housing. So there really isn't a solution. And we unintentionally sometimes, I think, uh, inspire a lack of hope. Um, and I just think we have an obligation to not do that, number one. And of course, in some communities, there's not necessarily any housing that's easy to find. But Matt, you said this earlier, I'm going to connect a big dot here. When we're serious about getting people off the street, and perhaps they're extremely vulnerable and have other conditions that merit an all-hands, all-in approach, then we need to be able to have a coordinated outreach strategy approach that allows us to prioritize people uh, carte blanche in an encampment if it's being mitigated or individually, depending on their needs and uh, what, uh, what we're uh, trying to do with that location, right? And I think this is where we actually do have some flexibility and nimbleness as communities in our coordinated entry policies and procedures to make them work in the moment in high priority situations and for high priority or high vulnerability folks. And so I just think there's there's a big 
kind of bundle things there. Most of all, we need to make sure we get our housing and our other viable interim solutions if that's what has to be offered. As Matt, you said, everyone has a housing resource, mm -hmm. bar none. And so what does that look like? And when we do that, then we can inspire hope. And when we go all the way back to engagement and starting the conversation, we can say, no, I'm going to stick with you until you're in a safe, stable place. I know it seems pretty hopeless. I know you've struck out many times, but that's my job. And I'm, I'll be back tomorrow or see you when, when you're ready for, to see me again uh, and just stay at that persistence. So I, I hate to go on about that, but I think there's, there's a lot there that we have a responsibility to orchestrate and then bring to the street level, to the individual conversation. And that I think gives us a basis for engagement. Mm -hmm. That's my yammering. Um, <laughs> don't see other questions, but I'll, I'll again invite folks to come off, come off mute or drop in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Well, I'll just say, well, and maybe while people are thinking about a question, something that you mentioned, Tom, that occurred to me that I just wanted to to riff on a little bit. I often encounter this um, this misconception that you can't do encampment decommissioning because it's inconsistent with HUD's coordinated entry prioritization uh, guidance. That going into one area and offering a housing resource to everyone, regardless of their acuity level, is somehow inconsistent or, or in violation of HUD's guidance for uh, coordinate entry prioritization. And it couldn't be further from the truth. And so I just wanna, that that if, if you're concerned about how to manage your coordinated entry process in a way that is aligned or consistent with HUD guidance, um, there it absolutely is possible to do that in a geographically specific encampment decommissioning way. Um, the two are not incompatible. Uh, so I just wanted to be crystal clear about that. Yeah, and I'll give a concrete example. Sacramento, right as we speak, is working out new coordinated access policies around same day placement into shelter. And the top end of that same day policy in terms of vulnerability is a guaranteed placement to shelter. Right. And mm -hmm. so they're starting with, as you put it, Matt, not a complaint driven, but, you know, a person centered approach, mm -hmm. starting with vulnerability. And so, in other words, who did they pull all the stops out for as a community and guarantee playing out like, OK, here's our plan A, which is the next available shelter bed that meets your needs. Here's our plan B and here's our plan C. You play out all the scenarios and you start at the top with, you know, who's most vulnerable. And it could be. And this is what. I'm not speaking for Sacramento, by the way, I'm just giving an example of the, what they're processing. Are, are there other types of same day placement scenarios or needs, including that camp that has to close by a date certain? And so it's not necessarily a same day access guarantee, but it is a access guarantee for a defined geographic area that's going through mitigation or decommissioning or whatever we call it by a date certain. So there's a guarantee of a housing solution or a viable interim placement by a date. So that means no one is told, just pick up and move, right? Uh, but they're just starting on that journey. They're nowhere near as far along as uh, some of the other communities in that highlight. Not yet. All right, ask one last time if you have anything in the chat, if you want to come off mute and ask a question or say how things are going in your community that we can learn from that. We'll give you that moment. And if not, we'll begin to wrap up. All right, not saying any. Matt, Tom, you have any closing remarks before we close out? <laughs> I should have thought of something uh, pithy so and uh, inspiring. Um, it's hard work, and I, everyone, I, I, uh, it, it's it's just really challenging work, and I think it it, it requires a community, a total community response, um, and uh, and it's it's just not easy. <laughs> but it can be done. I'll I'll leave it at that. It's yeah. Part, you know, I think we need to we need to believe to our in our core that we can do this. The pandemic just showed us, this isn't about how to do this. 
This is about whether we have the will and we're willing to put the resources into it. And those resources really aren't aren't audacious, I mm -hmm. think is what we know. So that's great. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Tom. Thank everybody for joining us and attending this California Housing and Community Development Community Workshop session offered through the Emergency Solution Grant Coronavirus Relief Staffing and Services contract. There will be a survey that pops up after the end of the session. Feel free to uh, give us any feedback that you have. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is our last community workshop. So thank you for being here and have a good rest of your day.